We are grateful, Father. We are grateful. Father, we can't thank you enough. We can't. We can't. For finding us worthy of this path, this path of life, of transformation. For finding us worthy of being a part of the remnant of people that you're calling in the last days to facilitate the return of Jesus Christ. Father, we're grateful. These realities are no longer far-fetched for us. Christ-likeness is no longer a distant reality. It is here. We're grateful for your faithfulness in our lives, for your nearness, for your proceeding word, always speaking to us, releasing to us the word of life, that which changes us, transforms us. Father, we are grateful. We give you praise, God. And Father, we are here again to receive from you. Our hearts are open, O oh God. The channels of our spirit are open. And we ask that as you speak to us, we will become. In the name of Jesus, we are ready to change. We are ready to be transformed. We are ready to die. To die to flesh. To die to self. Because we know the more we die to self and to flesh, the more our life will become in you. And what we gain is nothing. What we lose is nothing compared to what we gain. And so we're ready to lose so we can gain more of you. Father, we thank you. Thank you for this season of manifestation of greater glory. We give you praise, Father. We honor you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's be seated. Hallelujah. We give God praise. Uh, God is so good. Um, and thank you to everyone that shared on behalf of the community. And I know, if given the opportunity, that quite a number of us um, will want to testify to the faithfulness of God. Hallelujah. And thank you um, for the way you, you broke down the testimony, you know, Thank you for validating the word of God in this space, you know, because I always say that God is not a talkative, that every time he speaks, he has expectations, and every time he speaks, his power is made available for us to become what he says. And um, over the years, within the Reformation, for those of my brothers who are here, is Henry here? Okay, Henry is now here. My brother is here, Big John. Um, we've been on this journey for, you know, close to two decades. And we can make reference over the period of 20 years. We can make reference to the different downloads from the heart of God and what they did to us. We can say in 2012, we went through tracking final maturity. This was what tracking final maturity did to us. And everything, as God is speaking, we're becoming. It's like line upon line, precept upon precept, a layer of block on top of another. That is how it has been within the Reformation. Every word, every session carries power to make us become. Hallelujah. And so the way he broke down his testimony just helped us understand how God speaks and how God builds our lives. That's how. You know, and if you're truly open and you're tracking properly, trust me, you will be able to say, when we had this, this was all shifted in my life. When God gave us this download, this was how it impacted my marriage, how it impacted my career, how it impacted my relationships. That is how deliberate God is. He is not a talkative. He doesn't just speak for fun. So anytime you say, oh, I heard God, God spoke to me. 
weeks and months down the line, you should be able to see the impact of that word because the word of God is alive. It's alive. And so this is how to track God and track our growth so that from time to time you can see the grounds you have covered. You know, dealing with God is not something that should be, you know, confusing. It's very practical. It's very practical. Very, very. And that's how it must be. We must be pragmatic believers. Pragmatic believers where you can see the changes that have been, you know, produced in your life as you continue to interact with the Word of God. Hallelujah. And we are also in a season where as God speaks, we become. You know, there's no time. There's no time. There's no time to sit on the matter for months and for years without shifting. No. No, there's no time. Now God speaks. He expects us to become. He speaks. He expects us to become. And the grace of God is available to facilitate that for us. All we have to do is to ensure that our heart represents a fertile ground. It's for us to ensure that we are productive hearers, you know, producing 30-fold, 60-fold, and even 100-fold. That's all you need to do. Once that's your heart posture, you will become. Amen. All right, so we're having the fourth installment of um, the series, Relevant Productivity, which is actually a major plug-in to living from eternity and for eternity. Um, And so today, we will be, you know, breaking it down a little bit further into what I call the principle of proportionality. The principle of proportionality. And... um, I mentioned this last week, Sunday. And these are dimensions of truth that you must know. Every believer must know these things, you know, because your work with God has to be on certain fundamental truth of the Bible. Because if your work with God is not built on this fundamental truth, you will not be able to work with God successfully. And that is why God is revealing his heart to us. He's revealing his heart to us because we are a people who want to please God. We want to please our Father. We're not living for ourselves. We're living for purpose. We're not living for money. We're not living for fame. We're not living for anything that is earthly. We are living for God. And because God has seen our hearts and he has seen that these, my people, are truly willing to please me, he is then opening us up to the principles and the values that will empower us and enable us to please him. Because it is not in the nature of God to give holy things to dogs. That's what the Bible says. You know, it is not in his nature to give precious things to people that will not appreciate them. And that is why God is speaking to us the way he is speaking to us in this house. Showing us certain things that sometimes when God even speaks to me, I sense his vulnerability. And I say this with all sense of carefulness. You know, you sense the heart of God and you, in, in connecting with his heart, you see how vulnerable God is, particularly regarding his love. Because love makes you vulnerable. Love makes you vulnerable. And the way God loves us makes him vulnerable. So it was that vulnerability that caused him to send his son Jesus to come here, die a death of shame, went through all of the things he went through because of us. Vulnerability. And so it's a privilege sometimes when you, when you just, God just shows you his heart and you, and you see his vulnerability, you see the pain and the anguish that he feels for humanity and especially for his people. You know, and it's a privilege, like I said, for God to be able to take us, you know, back into the back end to say, this is my heart concerning this matter. It's a privilege. And that is what God is doing with us in this house. Hallelujah. And I said this last week that the output of your life must match the input of God in your life. That is a principle of proportionality. The output of your life must match the input of God in your life. And I said that the way it is in our offices, where as you resume a new job in a formal setting, they give you your job description. 
That's the first thing they gave you. And for some of them, these job descriptions will come with KPIs, key performance indicators, things that would show that you are actually delivering on the task and the assignment that you're supposed to deliver on. It's called KPIs, key performance indicators. And then sometimes they also give you time frame within which to achieve the KPIs. And one of the things that they will ensure they do, particularly the organization or particularly the HR unit, is to give you what they call enablers. Enablers are the things that will aid you to meet your targets. They will give you all the tools that you need. You need a computer, they will get you a computer. They will get you a workstation. They will get you a workspace. They will get you an internet. Get you your ID card if you are... You, you, you are uh, a journalist to give you access into places, you know. So they will give you the enablers, all the things that should help you meet your target. And at the end of the month, they expect you to meet your target. So if you're supposed to churn out as a journalist five stories in a month, they expect you to churn out five stories in a month. And so they give you the target. If you are in real estate marketing, the same thing. They will give you sometimes, they give you a car. If you, of course, you know this with the banking sector. They will give you a car, nice car. The car is an enabler. It's an input of the management of the bank into your life to aid you to meet your target. Sometimes they even go as far as giving you loans. They will give you, and some actually just give you know, wardrobe allowance. So that you can look the part. So that when you go to meet certain high net worth clients, you, you will look the part, they will look at you and say, okay, I can trust my money with this person. So they, they will give you everything that you need. But they have expectations. They have expectations. That is why you see those organizations, they don't bat an eye. Once it's time for evaluation, they will evaluate you. And if you're not meeting up, what do they do? They will offload you very quickly. Because to them, you are an investment. An investment that must produce. And so as they keep giving you all of those enablers and all of that, in addition to your salary, they have expectations. And so when you're not producing and you're not bringing forth their expectations and you're not meeting expectations, a matter of time, they have your first, second evaluation report and it's not in the positive, they will offload you. That is how God is. You may not get the understanding of the offloading of God now, but it happens in its own way. Hallelujah. So the same way your management has expectations, the same way those running, those enterprises and those organizations have expectations, that is how God is. Hallelujah. He has expectations. The principle of proportionality is a kingdom principle now being used in various fields, including law, ethics, and international relations, to ensure that actions or measures taken are appropriate and not excessive in relation to their intended objective. And I said to us last week that it see it's there in international relations. It's there in how countries, you know, even fight wars. It's one of the things a lot of people are complaining about, the UN is complaining about, about Israel, that the level of force Israel is using against Hamas is bigger than Hamas and, you know, what they did on October 7th. But those guys don't want to hear they are going all the way. Proportionality in international relations. So it's a kingdom principle. It's a kingdom principle that we must be aware of. And so God takes note of the measure of his investment in us, which then determines the output and outcome he expects from us. He takes note of the measure of his investment in your life. And when we say investment, remember, we we'll we'll broke it down and we'll still break it down next week. It's inclusive of time. The time that you have, there's a measure of time that we all have. We just don't know, but there's a measure. And I said to us, every day we draw down. Relationships. 
your spouse, your marriage is a blessing. The literal money you have, your job, your career, your skills, your knowledge and abilities that you have. These are all impute of God in your life. And God expects you to use them to advance his purposes on earth. And you can't say God has not given you anything. He knows your capacity. He gives according to your capacity. So he expects, so that thing that you call little that God has given to you is expecting returns on it. It may not look significant and that is why you can't be here and you look down on yourself. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter your social background. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter the level of education that you have presently. You need to understand that there's something that you have currently that God has given to you and God expects returns on those things. Proportionality. Matthew chapter 11 from verse 20 to 26. Then he began to denounce that is Christ began to denounce the people in the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. And I'm reading from Amplified. He began to denounce them in which what? Most proportionality. Most of his miracles. So God was taking note. So in this city, let's, let's say I perform 20 miracles. In this city, perform two miracles. And so his expectations is that this city where he performed 20 miracles, the expectation is that these people, there should be more convert here than here. These people should be more responsive to the, to the gospel. That's what this is saying to us. He began to denounce the people in the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent and change their hearts and lives. Because to repent means to change your heart and change your life. Change your ways. Turn around. Stop doing that thing. That is what repentance means. They didn't. And he went on to say... Whoa! And anytime you say whoa, that is declaring what? Judgment. Judgment is coming to you. Chorazin. And he went on, woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles done in you had been done in Ty and Sidon, cities of the Gentiles, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Their hearts would have been changed and they would have expressed sorrow for their sin and rebellion against God. Can you see that? He's saying, if the level of work done here had been done here, these people would have repented. But because the level of work that's been done here is so much and you did not repent, judgment is coming upon you proportionality. God weighs the work and his investment in our lives. Proportionality. Proportionality. That's why I tell us, don't compare yourself with one another. Don't. Proportionality. To whom much is given, much is what? Much is expected. He said they would have repented long ago. And he went on in verse 22. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the pagan cities of Ty and Sidon on the day of judgment than you. Can you see that? It will be what? More tolerable for Ty and Sidon than you, Chorazin and Bethsaida, because I had much more investment in you. So on the day of judgment, I am going to use my impute in your life to judge you. On the day of judgment. And these are things we cannot afford as believers, particularly living in these last days. These are things we can't afford to be ignorant of. This is the judgment of God. I told us about the dream I had a couple of years ago. In the dream, God said to me, a lot of Christians will go to hell. Not a pleasant dream. 
What a pleasant revelation. And I asked God, God, why? I cried. I cried in the dream and cried out of the dream and I was still crying. And he said, because my people don't know my judgment and they don't know my standard. They don't know my judgment, they don't know my standard. And they know there is not head knowledge, it's not know about. It's the knowing that makes you become one with. Hallelujah. You see, when you know, I know my wife. I know things I would do, you understand, that would, she would not be happy with, right? And because I know, that knowledge then empowers me to live and to do things that will please her. Are you getting it? Uh-huh. So that knowledge empowers me not to do things that will break her heart. That is the kind of knowledge you're talking about. Not just knowing about. Because a lot of people know about God, but they don't know God. They know about him. It's different to know about God. It's different. The knowing here is becoming one with So God said, they don't know my judgment and they don't know my standards. And what God is doing in these last days is that he's revealing his heart to us. Generations before now, there are a lot of things that they did not come into. God will use the level of revelation in their day to judge them. God will use the revelation, the level of revelation in our day, revelation of his standard, of his nature, of his character, of his son to judge us. And we will know too much. We know a lot. See, there has never been this level of revelation of Christ in all of time. There has never been. There has never been. And another thing that is also facilitating that is technology. Technology is facilitating the spread of the gospel. And the spread of the knowledge of God. So, the knowledge of God is where now you're at your fingertips. Anything you want to know right now, if I should ask now any question, how many times is righteousness mentioned in the Bible, I will give you guys just one minute. I will have answers. 20 years ago, for you to be able to do that, you will need to get a big concordance Bible. <laughs> Those ones, they don't leave your study because you can't carry them for a service, for a service like this. Very big. And you go to the back and then you will see. But today, that's no longer the case. So we are more privileged in these last days. The age of AI. We are more privileged. I don't know what excuse we're going to give. And even some of us, God goes, Next week, I don't know when, but God will help us get there where I will take us through the specifics because you can't afford to be ignorant. I will take you through the specifics of the expectations of God from you. What is expecting from you? Specifics. So that you won't be, you know, you won't be ignorant. You won't be like, oh, I didn't know. No, no, you will know. You will know that he expects you to win souls. You will know that he expects you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. You will need to know that that your office is part of all the world that you need to go to. You will need to know that you see that device in your hand, that your phone, where you have followers, people connecting with you from different parts of the world. You will need to know that that is part of all the world you need to go to and win souls. You need to know. And God will factor in the device. God will factor in the data. (laughs) He will factor in the time. And you will ask, at this stage of your life, I gave you access to mobile devices, internet enabled, with data on it, and I expected you, and then you had 1,000 followers on IG, 3,000 followers on Facebook, connections on LinkedIn, This is all the world. How much of my word did you spread, did you share on these platforms? How many souls did you win, knowingly and unknowingly? God will count. He will. See, don't take your father for granted. 
See, don't take it for granted. See, he's loving, he is sweet. Yes. He's loving, he is sweet. Let me tell you this, he is also severe. He is. You see, on that day of judgment, he's going to do what he's going to do. Crocodile tears won't do it. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we read the scripture last week. He said, he who does not know his master's will will still be what? We still be flogged. You know that was why were you ignorant? Why were you ignorant? You will still be flogged. And then it's now worse for those who know and refuse to do. It's worse. You see, what God is doing in the finishing church and in these last days is this. He's preparing us for manifestation. Right? He's equipping us to facilitate the return of Jesus Christ and thirdly, he's preparing us for the white throne judgment. He's preparing us for the white throne judgment. You can't be oblivious of what the white throne judgment looks like and the questions you'll be asked. No. They're in the Bible. All you need to do is read the Bible and check your life. As a matter of fact, you can even score yourself. Some of us, we may not be able to entirely score yourself, but our next thing, you can score yourself. You can have an idea of where you are and where you are going. All you need to do, because life is an open book exam. Hallelujah. Life is what? An open book exam. It's like, you know, you're in a class, and they say, okay, this is an exam, and they give you the questions, and they put the textbook next to you. So all you have to do to answer the questions is to do what? Consult the textbook. But unfortunately, people still fail that kind of exam. <laughs> and so in the same way, unfortunately, some people will fail this exam of life because they are not looking with intelligence. They are not looking in partnership with the Holy Spirit, looking at the textbook of life, which is the word of God, to live. The word of God is a textbook of life. That's why the word of God must be your best friend. Hallelujah. If you are sleeping, what do you do? Great. This is about your eternity. It's very important. It's about your eternity. Pinch yourself. Amen. So you cannot and you should not fail the exam of life. Because they need the textbook that you can consult for the questions is right at your fingertips. A time is coming. Do you know technology will even go further? Very soon, very soon you will not need these devices. So all you need to do is just push a button on your hand and your screen will show in front of you. And then you will put in, give me Genesis chapter 1. And then I will be like this and I will be reading Genesis chapter 1 and there's nothing in front of me. Oh, ah, uh, the glasses are even here. You know, where you have all those glasses, goggles, you know, they are there and then you just look and just, you know, give it a prompt and it gives you a scripture. It's coming. So what is happening, technology is fast-tracking our becoming. Amen. Technology is aiding our transformation. And so today we say YouTube is the biggest free university in the world, right? You can learn anything now. And people can learn God. People can freely learn skills without paying. Can access knowledge, vast amount of knowledge freely. But yet, in the midst of all of that ease brought about by technology, people don't still know God. People don't know God. God is going to ask our generation. God is going to ask us. He's going to ask us. And those who are in this part of the world, don't compare yourself with Christians who are in Syria and Iraq and Iran. God understands their conditions. On the day of judgment, he will take those conditions into consideration. So don't act as if oh, your case is better. You know, it's not better. Depending on how you are using your own ease and peace and relative peace and relative ease, God will ask you. Hallelujah. This we cannot afford not to know. You can't afford not to know this about your father. I beg you. You see, that day is going to come. All of us, including myself, I'm going to give account. I'm going to stand before the Father and give account. Every one of you will stand before the Father and give account. 
All of us. What account are you going to render? This is the time. And so God is alerting us to this truth so that we can be better and do better. Hallelujah. And it's a privilege. Amen. So he said, nevertheless, I said to you, it will be more tolerable, can you see that? For the pagan cities of Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. In other words, it will be easier for them than for you. Because much more work was done in you. Proportionality. And you, Capernaum, are you to be exalted to heaven for your apathy and unresponsiveness? They were not responsive to God. He said, do you want me to reward you for that? Do you want me to take you to heaven for that? For your apathy and your unresponsiveness? Do you want me to reward that? I'm not going to reward that. That's what God is saying. Is that you will descend to Hades, the realm of the dead. For if the miracles done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. So as you sit here, I need you to weigh the resources of God in your life. All the downloads you have received here, the empowerment that you're receiving, the support system that you're receiving, the blessings in material terms, the job that you have, the marriage that you have, your partner in that relationship. God is going to take every bit of that provision into cognizance on the day of judgment. Hallelujah. Amen. And so it is important for us to know this truth now about God so that we can adjust our ways, so that we can be more circumspect in the way we live and in the way we treat the resources of God. I also need us to know, like I said, please, by all means, aspire for more. Aspire for more. Aspire for promotion and all of that. But have this at the back of your mind that to whom much is given, much is what? Much is expected. Luke 21. Another thing again today is we're thanking God, right? Mm. In the way you give your offering of dance, the way you dance, your gratitude will reflect in the way you dance today. And if God has given you this much and you are dancing this much, you see... <laughs> It will reflect. It will reflect in your offering, in your Thanksgiving offering. By the way, we only take offering once here. So we won't take normal offering and Thanksgiving offering. No, it's once. It will reflect in your Thanksgiving offering. If he has done this much for you within the quarter, and you are thanking God this little, okay, proportionality. Luke 21 from verse 1, and you will see that. So Jesus was in the temple on this occasion and he was monitoring those who were giving to the temple. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. He said, truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance are put in offerings for God. But she, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood that she had. Proportionality. That's the principle here. It's just a simple principle of proportionality. Like, this woman gave out of her poverty, but you see these guys here, they gave out of convenience. They gave out of convenience. Proportionality. So God is watching. So at the end of the day, it was not the actual amount. It was the actual heart. <laughs> the heart of sacrifice. There was sacrifice in one, but there was no sacrifice in the other. Even though the actual amount was greater. 
Mm-hmm. The actual amount of those who had was greater than the two mites that this woman gave. But God does not look at the actual amount. God looks at the sacrifice of the heart. So she gave more proportionality. Proportionality. So it's important for us to have this at the back of our mind. And then in Matthew 11.25, as I round off the session today, because we still have Thanksgiving, we still need to dance and give God praise. I need this to sit in our heart. Let this truth sit in your heart. You see, heaven is counting on you to get it right. Heaven is counting on our generation to get it right, to please God, to live for God, to live for purpose, to live right, to live in alignment with the will of the Father. And that is why we are always grateful for where we are in the Spirit, where God can reveal His heart to us on a consistent basis, telling us and teaching us how to please Him, teaching us what truly pleases Him, not what we want to offer, but what He wants. What a privilege that is. Hallelujah. What a privilege. What a privilege. Emmanuel, which would you prefer? Would you prefer, you know, you have a heart for service, you have energy to serve, all right? Would you prefer that you just keep doing things for me and with me and just doing, doing, doing? Or would you rather want to know what FA needs? Which one? Ah, the latter. That's it. I would rather want to know what God needs. Even though I have energy to do anything for him, I would rather want to know what will truly please him. That is better. That is better. That's why we call it relevant productivity. Because sometimes we do things that God has not called us to do. And you think you're pleasing God? No. You must connect with the heart of God to know what will please God. You must. You must. It's very important. Because if you don't connect with the heart of God, you will not know what pleases Him. You can be doing things and be full of activities, dispensing your energy, and God is just looking and saying, no, you are not touching my heart. You are not touching my heart. You are not touching my heart. And so this is what God is doing today. And with this series, revealing his heart to us and saying, connect with my heart. Let me tell you what I want, not what you think I want. <laughs> Let me tell you what I need, not what you think I need. That is a major difference amongst believers in these last days. Some people will give God because it's within their power to give, it's because they like to give, it's because, you know, and all of that. And God is looking, you're not touching my heart. You're not touching my heart. That's not what I need from you right now. You're not touching my heart. So what God is doing right now is that God is aligning us and positioning us rightly for us to touch his heart so that we can give him what he wants. Because it is those who give him what he wants that will receive the commendation, well done, good and what? Faithful servant. Connect with the heart of the Father. Relevant productivity. And it's a privilege that God is having this conversation with us. And saying that as you go about your work, as you go about your life, do not disconnect anything you do from my heart. And that is why you need to ask yourself, your marriage was designed to glorify God. Is my marriage glorifying God? Is my marriage serving as an encouragement to other people? Is my marriage upholding the standard of the Father? Or is your marriage, are you just having your way? Having your way? Or you think your marriage is just for your convenience and your comfort? No, that institution was designed to show forth the relationship between Christ and the church. So it's not for your convenience and your comfort. Will comfort come out of it? Yes, but that's not the priority. The priority is to what? Is to please God. So you need to ask yourself your career. How is your career advancing the cause of the kingdom? How are you glorifying God with your career? How are you blessing humanity with your business? What is the output of the money and the resources and relationships that you have? How are they pleasing God? Is there a record in heaven of the output of your engagement with your time? 
Are there things that have been recorded in heaven that, yes, this person has done this in heaven? And you remember that box, eternity and time? Don't let it leave you. You know, if you can pull up the image, guys, please help me pull it up. Don't let that image leave you. Every day you go out, don't let it leave you. Make sure in every season you're doing what God would have you do. Right now, I'm, I'm entering a new season. God is shifting things around in my life. And it is important for me to align with him. Because if I continue on the path that I'm on, and I don't listen to him and turn things around in my life, I will be working for myself and not for him. Now he's showing up again and saying, Fred, it is time. Transition. It's coming. So I must listen to him. It doesn't matter what my preferences are. It doesn't matter what I want to do, what I don't want to do. He showed up at some point and he said, Fred, it's time for you to quit your job. You're nine to five. I had to make the transition. It was painful. It was tough. It was hard. But thank God for my wife who encouraged me. He said, come on, babe, we'll be fine. Go ahead. So you need to know in every season what will please God. Every season, every time. You need to know. Because we are not living for ourselves. We are living for him. And you can't successfully live for him if you don't know what pleases him. Else it will just become a lie. And so we need to know what pleases God. And that is why God is taking us through this process. Can we, is it possible? The image. Last scripture for today, Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. I openly and joyfully acknowledge your great wisdom that you have hidden these things, this spiritual truth from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants, to new believers, to those seeking God's will and purpose. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. Can you see what I said earlier on? You see, when God look at, looks at your heart and he sees that, oh, my son Emmanuel really and truly wants to please me, he will begin to reveal his heart to you. That's what he does. That's what he does. He knows that in this house we're not living for ourselves. We're not living for fame. We're not living for popularity. We're not living for money. We're living for purpose. That's why he's showing us his heart like this. This is also from Amplified. He said, you have not. He said, you hid this truth, spiritual truth, from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants who are infants, new believers on one hand, and then those seeking God's will and purpose. When you seek God's will and purpose, it will reveal hidden truths to you. It will take you behind the popular. It will take you behind the paparazzi. It will take you behind the drama and say, okay, come, 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 come. You, come, 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 come. come. Leave this drama. Come, let me truly show you what pleases me. And it will say, you see, this drama is just drama. They are just having a great time. I am not here, but this is where I am. He will reveal his heart to you because he has seen your heart that you want to please him. That's what God does. And we must not shift from that heart position. We must maintain that heart position, a heart that is willing to do his will, a heart that is willing to please the Father. Don't shift from that. As long as you maintain that, God will continue to reveal his heart to you. And this thing that I'm saying is for everybody, including men of God. You see, if I shift, if my heart shifts, this work, it shifts from truly pleasing the Father to pleasing people's flesh and desires, or to maybe popularity and growth and success in the way people define success, God will stop revealing this hidden truth to us. If we shift our heart and we go the popular route because we want to accommodate you shift his values. You lower the standards. God will stop revealing his heart to us. He will. So we must continue to prioritize pleasing God, seeking his will and his purpose. Hallelujah. And so as long as we keep seeking to please God, he will continue to reveal his heart to us 
teaching us how to please him. Teaching us how to please him. Hallelujah. And what a privilege this is. It's a privilege that God can take us out of the drama. Everything that's happening as a come. I am burdened. I am burdened for children. They can call you out of the noise and everything as it come. A lot of these people who are shouting hallelujah right now, they don't have a part in me. They don't have any relationship with me. They are just having a great time. They are just having a great time. He shares his burden. And carrying and sharing this burden of God is not a pleasant thing. It's not. Because you, 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 when his heart is grieving for souls, you know, you feel it too. It's not a pleasant feeling at all. It's not. It's not. When he puts a burden for marriages on your heart, and he said, it breaks my heart every time a marriage falls apart. It breaks my heart that even in my church, marriages are not holding anymore. It breaks my heart. And it puts that burden on you. And then he begins to tell you, pray for marriages. He begins to tell you, do something around marriages. Mentor other people. Or he begins to tell you, your starting point is to make sure that your own marriage becomes an example. Say, work at it. Don't give up. Work at it. Don't give up. Work at it. Don't give up. The burden of the Lord. He will share his burden with you. As long as you keep seeking his will and his purpose. Hallelujah. So that is how we ought to live. Every day, don't forget that image. Your identity, your purpose, your values, your inst instructions, your character, principles, blueprint, ideas, wisdom, money, relationships, all of those things must flow to you from eternity. And you then engage with them in time and then they will need to flow back again as treasures into eternity. This is how to live. You live from eternity and for eternity. This is how we can give God relevant productivity. Not what we think. You can stumble on your purpose and your calling. You can't just decide, I want to live here, I want to live there. I'm not feeling like Nigeria anymore, I'm feeling like UK. No, you can't feel like it, you must hear, it must be what he's telling you to do. You can't. You can't wake up and just make up your mind and say, it's my life, I can decide. No, you can't decide, it's not your life. Except if you're truly living for yourself, it's okay. But you can't say you are living for God and you make those decisions on your own. You must ask yourself, where, where is God in this decision now? God, is this what you would have me do? You must be led by the Spirit. Else, you will be engaged in that whole decision. You can go there, make money, and do all of that, but it will end in time. You see, whatever originates in time, ends in time. But whatever originates from eternity will end where? In eternity. If it comes from the heart of God, when you engage with it in time, it will flow to the heart of God. Hallelujah. This is how we must live every day. So God is counting on you. God is counting on you. I said this to us during quarry session. A pastor friend and I were talking and he said, God needs more churches. And we don't have enough churches. And at first it was like, Seriously? But I thought about it and I actually, yeah, actually. Because God has also been talking to us about that, about the kind of people. God has a lot of people, but there's a kind that he wants. And I want to say to us that the harvest is still plenteous and the laborers are still very few. Don't kid yourself. Don't look at the number of churches that we have. Don't look at the number of the servants of God that we have. It's not every servant of God that is serving God. Forget it. It's not. It's not every believer that is living for God. So God is looking for verses today. He's looking for verses today. He's looking for more verses. He's looking for voices. He's looking for people that will open their mouth and they will fill it with his present truth. He's looking for people that will share his burden. That's what he's looking for. Not those who want to do ministry just to fill a gap. No, 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 no. Those that would do it for him. 
So this is how to live. Because if you do those things, at the end of the day, they may be good in the eyes of man, but it will end up in Matthew 7, 22. You know that now. We heal the sick in your name. We raise the dead in your name. And he will say, you did all of that to make yourself feel important. You didn't, did, didn't do it for me. You actually did it for yourself because he gave you a measure of worth. The accolades that came from that broadcast that you raised a dead person, from that meeting that was all over the place, that accolade was for you. It wasn't for me. You don't want that kind of productivity. You don't. We must pursue relevant productivity. That which emanates from God and then to God. Amen. Do we have that video? Let's cue it. Let's rise on our feet and just give God thanks for today and for this word. Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things, this spiritual truth from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants, to new believers, to those seeking God's will and purpose. He said, yes, Father, for this way was well pleasing in your sight. Jesus also said in another instance that many righteous men, prophets and righteous men, desired to see what you see, but was not given to them. There were generations in the past that desired to come into the dimensions that God has brought us into in this season, but it was not time. And it has pleased God in our day to bring us into these dimensions. So let's appreciate God. Now you know how to please God. God relevant. Now you know how to position yourself and how to walk and how to live in time to receive that commendation. Well done, good and faithful servant. Now you know. Appreciate God for it. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Express your gratitude. Express your gratitude to God. Express your gratitude to God. Express your gratitude to God. And I need us to also thank God for grace because God is releasing grace for us to please him. He's releasing grace. He's releasing grace. He's releasing grace. By this message, you have been empowered. And right now, it's an opportunity for empowerment. And so I need us to also draw grace and say, Father, give me grace to give you relevant productivity. Give me grace. Give me grace. Give me grace. The output of my life will be commensurate with your input in my life. Come and talk to God. Talk to God. Establish it today. Talk to God. Talk to your father. And say his imputes in your life will produce expected output. Establish that today. Establish it right now. 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 And also ask God for grace. Father, give me grace. Because by flesh shall no man prevail. It is not by power, it is not by might, but by the Spirit of the Lord. So ask God for grace, ask God for grace, and say, Father, give me grace to give you relevant productivity. Give me grace to give you relevant productivity in the name of Jesus. Help me, Father, to live for you. Help me to live for purpose. Help me to live for purpose. Help me to please you, O God. I will please you, Father, with everything that you have given to me. In the name of Jesus, I will please you. With my marriage, I will please you. With my career, I will please you. With the time you have given to me, I will please you. With my business, I will please you. With my relationships, I will please you. Even with the challenges uh, that I'm going through, that I've gone through, Father, I will please you with them. Uh, in the name of Jesus. 
I will not be a bad investment in the kingdom. I will not be a bad investment, Father. I will not hide your talent. I will not misuse and misappropriate your resources. I will use them for the purpose for which they have been given to me. In the name of Jesus, I receive that wisdom. I receive grace and wisdom. I receive grace and wisdom. I receive grace and wisdom to use your resources, oh God, for the purpose for which they have been given to me. In the name of Jesus. They will not lie dormant in my heart. I will not hide your resources. I will not hide your resources. I will not hide your resources. The books will be written, oh God. The songs, oh God, will be produced and released in the name of Jesus. The businesses, oh God, will be set up, oh God, in the name of Jesus. We will build Goshen. We will build Goshen. As a kingdom community, Father, we will build Goshen. And I will play my part in my own life as an individual, oh God. I give attention oh God, to everything you have committed to me, oh God, in the name of Jesus, I give attention to everything that you have put in my hands, in the name of Jesus. The light that's on the inside of me will shine. The voice you have given to me, I will use it to speak. We come out of that sense of self-preservation that keeps us locked in our cocoon where you don't want to open your mouth and let people know that you carry the light of God. And Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me and you deny me before men, he said, I will deny you before my heavenly father. I know your platform is for business. Does it have a room for God? I know that platform is to promote your career. Is there a space for God? I know that business is for, to make money and for sustenance, but is there a space for God in that business? Relevant productivity. This is what it means to live for God. Where every aspect of your life is serving its purposes. And heaven is counting on you. God is looking for men. The harvest is plenteous. The darkness is becoming more gross. God is looking for vessels. People that will shine his light in the midst of the growing darkness. For some of us, you will need to band together with others to be able to give expression to the things that God has put on the inside of you. It is not everybody that will be Moses. Some of us are Aaron's. You need to find out what are those areas of my life that I need to connect with my brother so that it can have expression. Everybody cannot be CEOs. Everybody cannot be a founder. But that does not mean there's no room for your light to shine. Because the frustration with some of us is also because that thing that God has put on the inside of you, you're thinking you're the one to do it all by yourself. And God is saying no for some of you. I said, well, are you connect? There's a platform here. I need to connect with that platform. And on that platform, that light will shine. Because has not been given to you to be a Moses, you're struggling. But you don't know that there is also honor in being an Aaron. And I can assure you that the moment you recognize that, you will see that light will shine. That light will shine. So those things that God has put on the inside of you, don't leave them locked up. They must find expression. Connect with the right people. Be vulnerable. Bring other people in. 
let the light shine. Let the light shine. You see, the dimension of life that God has called us into in this season, you can't do it on your own, not in silos. It's community. Even Babylon knows the power of collaboration now. There's a young man in the U.S. who is building something very unique. (laughs) My goodness, this guy is building a virtual world. It's just the idea that we are still interacting with. This guy is building a virtual world. So he's building a platform that will bring change makers from all across the world together. And they want to build a virtual, an alternate world. An alternate world. Bringing change makers, impact makers together all across the world. They build it. The world understands that. And that is why in the church we must understand that as well. Unity of the faith. As a matter of our denominationalism is not the purposes of it's not part of the purposes of God. God has moved away from that actually. God is removing those boundaries and those walls now. And the starting point of that was networks. At the dawn of the 20th century or 21st century, networks began to emerge. That's why we have Congress WBN. It's one of the networks. We have other networks. Collaboration. And so as individuals as well, you must network. You must connect with people. You must build something that will endure. Because we know that as long as we keep dissipating energy in our silos, there's just very little we can achieve. But when we bring those things together, you get a nuclear reaction. You get a boom. Massive. So for some of you, the frustration you feel might just be that you're thinking you are the one to carry and to birth that thing. What if you're meant to connect with someone else? What if you're supposed to bring people together? Hallelujah. And that is why I bless God for this community. You see, guys, anytime you think the finishing church, don't think me. Don't think Lady Kems. Think us. Amazing things that some of you are doing for the finishing church behind the scenes. Some structures that are emerging. The quality of the wisdom and the thinking that's coming from assignment that I give to people here, it's amazing even to me. And I'll be like, wow, this is what it takes to build for the for God in these last days. <laughs> it has the fingerprint of everybody. It's not my fingerprint alone. It has the fingerprint of everybody. And I can say, that's why you see everything that comes out of us here has a fingerprint of a lot of people on it. From ideation to execution. That is what it will take to build for God in these last days. And when it builds like that, no man will be able to take the glory. Are you getting it? No man will be able to take the glory. I can't take the glory for what's happening in the finishing church. Because there are men and women in the back end who are doing stuff. Amazing things. Intelligent. Smart people. My goodness. Hallelujah. You see, the mandate of the finisher is too massive. It's too massive for this tiny, this brain of mine. No, it will require plenty brains <laughs> to come together to deliver on that mandate. It will require it. It will require it. And if I'm not open to that, then it won't get done. If this is mine, this is not my ministry, this is the mission of the Lord. And I pray to God every day, I say, God, I will not stand in the way of what you're building in the finishing church. The day I want to stand in the way, take me out, literally. Because I don't, I, you see, I'm too insignificant when you compare to the purposes of God and what God wants to achieve in the finishing church. I am too insignificant. What God wants to do in your life, your life, your life, your life, your life, I can't stand in the way. I have one assignment here to facilitate it. And the day I become an impediment, I don't want to live anymore. The day I become an impediment to what God wants to do in your lives as a collective, then I don't want to live anymore. Because I don't want to stand on the path of God. What God wants to do in your life and through you is bigger than me. It is. 
It is bigger than me. And heaven knows my heart. Heaven knows my heart. And so this is what it takes to build for God in these last days. That is why we're building Goshen. All hands must be on deck as we build Goshen. There is a personal part of it and there is a collective part of it. And initiatives will come to show us the collective part of building Goshen. A lot of initiatives are in the works. And remember what we're building is not just for the finishing church. It's for the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Because God is going to use us to resource the body of Christ in different ways. From finance, from money, to products, to tech tools, to initiatives, to programs, to different things that God is buffing here for the body of Christ and for humanity. No one man can do that. No. And so you must find your place in this. And I bless God for every one of you. For those who have put their hands on this plow. It is coming. It's coming together. Hallelujah. And so in your own individual life as well. All right? There are people you need to connect with to amplify what you're already doing. Don't hold back. Connect with them. Let's build for God. Hallelujah.